today is kind of a new invention for us. Uh, for those of you who know about the store, know that we're always having things here. We do lots of author talks, workshops, um, body, mind, spirit classes, um, music. Last night we had the blues by the Fu Yaya, Fu Yaya trio and Larry Gabriel. You know Larry? <laughs> so he was playing the banjo and the guitar and we were just having a wonderful time right here. So <clears throat> I usually like to include music because what else is there besides books and music and food? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> that is it. And so I was inspired, um, oh first of all, to let those who have not been here know, we are a non-fiction bookstore. And our books are in the categories of history and culture, health and well-being, books that are by and about women, metaphysical, spiritual, new age, and the arts. So that's really what we do. Now to keep our snooty index in check, <laughs> we do have a little science fiction, a little poetry, and a few prize-winning novels. So that keeps us from being too snoot snoot. <laughs> right. So I want to start by saying that I was overly excited highly inspired and just couldn't get over the fact that the New York Times Holiday Magazine section did a feature. I don't know if any of you have seen that feature. And it says here, uh, what, the extra what the extraordinary range of contemporary literature by black men says about us. Hi, come on in. And so when I turned to this part here, and saw these wonderful, beautiful black men, I just said, ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> Now, what they did is they picked out big per people, some I don't even know, who were mostly novelists, playwrights, poets, short story writers, um, there's another poet, playwright, I think there was one other category, novelist, playwright, I think I said that, that poet, but that's, those are the categories of just this group of people. And I thought to myself that this is a group of, of uh, artists who are never seen as a group, never seen as a unit but of people who are writing today, I'm not talking about another time back, but are writing today that really their voices, I'm sure, have resonance with each other because they're writing in this particular time. So being the bookseller that I am, <laughs> I'll do anything to bring people into the store, to know about stuff. Not just to buy books, but to know about things. And so I thought, we have people right here in the metropolitan Detroit area. So I focused my attention on African American men who have published, that was important, it's important to me, I'll tell you what, who have published and who live in the metropolitan area and, um, to, and from the five different genres that I wanted to have nonfiction, fiction, poetry, sci-fi, fantasy, and memoir. So today we have all five of those genres will be represented. Hopefully uh, Shakur will be here because um, he has his memoir. And so I'm imagining doing this another two or three times during this year because this is going to be, and this is, I should say, our uh, flagship statement for our 30 years in bookselling in Detroit. <laughs> Took me a while to get around to the reason, right? <laughs> so with 30 years of bookselling in Detroit, I wanted to do something new and fresh. And I don't know if anybody heard the spot on the radio talking about this event this evening. But it was played during the week. And um, we'll have more spots, but it didn't mention this event. So hopefully we'll do this again in the summer and again the next fall and winter with another crowd, unless you won't just have to come back. <laughs> never know. Okay, so I want to let the audience know that that's where the inspiration came from and uh, that we have right in our midst uh, so many people that are uh, here. Come on in and have a seat. There's chairs right up here and we've got more besides. Thank you. So the other thing is that I wanted to, uh, here, right here, Right in, right in, just squeeze on it. Um, I wanted to um, have a program in which we could hear the voices of the writers. So oftentimes when we have 
authors come in, uh, we had we listened to how they wrote the book, a little bit about the book, and so on. But I was again inspired when I was at the Miami Book Festival, and I went to hear four Jamaican women who write in different genres. And uh, they all read from their piece, and by the time we were just so immersed in their pieces, I thought, now that's another great way to do it. So instead of them having to tell you about themselves, uh, we're gonna have them read out loud, and we'll do the listening. Andre, who's part of our team here at Source Books uh, Sellers, is going to moderate uh, a bit of a discussion. He's boned up on the books to some degree. He's going to um, take the place of Stephen Ward and read what he would, read, would have read. And then we're going to uh, hopefully have a little conversation between all of you about your work and then have questions, comments, and compliments from the audience and, and so forth, OK? To let you know that uh, I, Andrea, who's sitting there with the camera, is our media person, team person for the store. And she's going to make a video, I hope it's okay with you all. I didn't get your permission. <laughs> and so, because I want to blast out the fact that we have published African American male writers in our neighborhood. That's my that's my thing, and I'm sticking to it. Yes. Okay, <laughs> all right. So, um, another thing, I did go on the computer to find everybody, and everybody has a presence on the computer. Wardell, I am just impressed with all of the stuff you've got. <laughs> all the, he, he says his poetry a lot on the, on the, on the uh, Google and YouTube. Google, yeah, and YouTube. Mm -hmm. so I Google everybody. So um, uh, as I said, we are covering these categories today. And uh, Wardell is going to start us off, not just this minute, uh, he is a poet. And I'm having Wardell start off because he's been writing poetry for over 50 years. Over, he's really young looking too. <laughs> a child probably. <laughs> <laughs> so he's been writing for this long period of time right here in Detroit. So I feel that his voice is very apropos to list, at least opening it up because I don't know, I'm not a poet, I don't really know, uh, I'm not, I don't have a strong knowledge of poetry, but I do know that poetry is a wonderful bridge between um, fiction and nonfiction, between memoir and fantasy, so it covers, I think, I mean, you'll have to fix me if I'm wrong, because I think it covers so much, so we're gonna have a Wardell start in just a few minutes. And then we have uh, Stephen Mac Jones, you're gonna be number two, and uh, he's a published author, two books now. Yes. And he's, you're also a playwright and poet, a few other things along the way. And uh, I tracked him down because he's a busy bird, and uh, I needed to get him here on a date that he could come here. So everybody else had to fall into your date. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. No, 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 no. I had to have something to blame it on. So, <laughs> so that's the way that worked. And of course, his presence on the uh, uh, on the internet is, uh, is very strong as well. And um, he was interviewed for uh, this his new book. Um, Lives Laid Away from a Publishers Weekly that I read every single week. It's a, a, a trade magazine that talks, tells us all about things that are in print and interviews and so on. So hopefully I can get this, uh, this uh, have them tell them about our event today and uh, let them know, of course, that you were here. Uh, also, he's a Kresge Arts Literary Fellow, and I'm really proud of that because I had a chance to do a panel with them at one time. So um, uh, I, I like following up and utilizing uh, that energy uh, that we have here in Detroit to the literary arts uh, panel. Uh, you were born in Lansing? Yes. My brother lives up there. Oh. Yeah. He went it's up there. He's a up good Detroit. place to be from. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he lives in East Lansing. Okay. That's better. All right. Okay. All right. So I know the road a lot but yes. right now resides in Farmington. So that gives us a, a person that's in our metropolitan area. And then we have um, Clarence Young, who is an old friend to the bookstore. And um, uh, he came once and was along with the other sci-fi fantasy crew that came to the store and has been on our shelf for the most part for quite a little while. 
So I'm, because uh, as I said, we keep our snooty index down by having some. <laughs> you do it well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> some uh, other genre for our customers as well. And uh, finally, no, no, next, Stephen Ward is not going to be here. He's uh, a historian, a professor at the University of Michigan. Uh, he focuses on uh, African American political thought and social movements, particularly the black power movement of the 1960s and 70s. Uh, his work focuses on the city of Detroit uh, and those two longtime Detroit activists, Grace and Jimmy Lee Boggs. So we're going to hear his words from through Andre's voice uh, later on. Um, Stephen also is very involved in Detroit. He has an organization uh, coming out of the University of Michigan, a semester in Detroit. So there are anywhere from uh, 12 to 15 to 20 or more students who spend the semester in Detroit learning about Detroit, taking their classes here, and having an internship with a nonprofit. So they're, they're, they're on their way. I think they're, a new group has just come in, or they're close to coming in again, and we usually host them and do something with them when they're here as well. And then finally, Yusuf uh, Shakur. Uh, Yusuf always says he was born in Detroit 4208, the dead zone, the place where all the bad things were. And I wanted to tell him today, because I hadn't had a chance to tell him, I was born in that zone too. <laughs> and it was not the way it was when he was, it's like many years before he was there. But he's written a memoir from his experience in, in incarceration. And he was also, hopefully he'll get here, he's going, going to be reading letters that his father wrote to him when he was in prison. So I just thought that was a wonderful combination of voices that are right here in our midst mm -hmm. uh, that uh, uh, reflect what the Times was talking about. The, what do they have to say for us at this time? So I'm going to start with uh, Wardell, the poet of over 50 years. Yes, yes. All right. Thank you. Uh, for the invite, and it's a real pleasure to be here to uh, share poetry with you and hear the collective voices who are here. Uh, the first one I'm going to do was, was actually published in an anthology by uh, Wayne State University. Some of you may have seen it, uh, Abandoned Automobile, and that includes, this is some, maybe some 12, 15 years ago, but it, it included poets in the metro uh, Detroit area. And this piece is called Roses Are Red. And it's a poem about poetry. Roses are red, violets are blue. I am a poet and so are you. He said to me, what do you think of that, Mr. Poet? I said, that's a novel beginning. Where are you going with it? That's it, man, he said. It's a quatrain. Two simple couples of verse. A quatrain inspired by Coltrane while riding the F train to Harlem. Do you get my train of thought? I said, your quatrain is too simple and not original. You've never been to New York, and the F train goes to Queens. You're about the only poet who can listen to Coltrane and come up with something that weak. He said, dare you go with your critique, Mr. Poet, criticizing my masterpiece. I don't have to go to your coffee houses, poetry bars, church clubs, college conferences, workshops, and poetry festivals to read and write poetry that nobody listens to or understands. I don't want to visualize vague villanelles, analyze any alliteration, be sensitive to a sonnet, a sentimental of some silly sestina, or believe a born ballad by a bootlicking bar. I read a hiccup and haiku, free bass and free verse, and I'm most skeptical about an endless epic, and I read a Mr. Muse than Mr. News. Real poets in the streets, in the shelters, in the ghettos, they get in trouble, they get high, they steal cars, they take what they want, they don't wait for an equal opportunity, they don't curse in verse, they curse the police at the very least. They live on the edge, they jump off the ledge, they don't send email, they get drunk and go to jail. And you, Mr. Poet, won't even post my bail. I said, how can I cut you some slack when you never pay me back? He said, you can leave now. I'm upset with you. I said, okay, there comes the warden, and you upset me too. But I care about you. And before this chatter gets any worse, I will leave you with this light verse. The angelines are yellow, lilies are white. Next time you're in jail, I'm on visit. I'll just write. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. Harass me not. I gave my wife a fragrant new perfume today. Its delicate aroma is called Harass Me Not. It's not that I'm jealous. She prefers it this way. When a boss comes too close, it makes him stop. Harass me not is pleasant and mild. It's not the same to drive a sexy boss wild. It goes well with her sensible makeup, hairdo, and proper office attire. She knows her job and does it well. She does not yield to his desire. He's been reported by three secretaries before, but it's the women who lose their jobs being thrown out the door. If I go down there and make a scene, my wife will be fired for having a husband so tough and mean. But when she places this special perfume on her desk, harass me not is guaranteed to keep away this pest. And next to it, she has a picture of me wearing an awful frown, letting her boss know that I know he's an office sex hound. She likes her work and wants to stay. So we have to embarrass her boss this way. She's ambitious, a respectable lady, trying to reach her career goal. She knows how to love her husband, and we don't get mixed up about her role. Now, if he's smart enough to be her boss, he shouldn't be dumb enough to try to cross a loving husband who's telling him tactfully to stop by giving his wife a perfume with such a label as, harass me not. <laughs> and I would like to close with this piece that I call I Don't Believe I don't believe all homeless people are lazy all corporations are corrupt all lawyers are liars all politicians are crooked all young people are hopeless all pretty women are tramps all good looking guys are dogs all poor folks are stupid, all white folks are racist, all black folks are criminals, all Mexicans are breeders, all Asians are aloof, all American Indians are alcoholics, all cops are killers, all priests are predators, all baby daddies are deadbeats, all intellectuals are out of touch, all artists are crazy, all gays are recruiters, all rich people are greedy, all atheists are troublemakers, all Jews are oppressive, all Arabs are terrorists, all Muslims are fundamentalists, all Christians are arrogant, all Buddhists are boring, all Americans are ugly, I don't believe in stereotypes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Wardell. Wow. And I have to say that Wardell is so generous with his poems because he'll write out, he'll uh, tear off a page and have, have, here, you take this and give it to him. He's so generous. And, I hope that we can get more of your work published. Okay, well, yes, thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Okay, <coughs> thank you. Stephen Mac Jones? Present. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please introduce your wife. Uh, my lovely wife and office manager, Mary Kay Jones. Uh, she. Let me put it this way, um, and for those of you who are sensitive to bad language, I'm not the guy you want to listen to. Um, <laughs> but when my first book sold, which was August Snow, um, she was so happy that she bought me a pair of socks. Now, that may not sound like much, but I'm the kind of guy that gets excited at seeing, you know, a bag of 12 tube socks for three ninety five, <laughs> that because you lose one, yeah. hey, you got a match for it. Right. But she bought me a pair of socks that says, "I make shit up for a living." And you know, aside from thirty years in advertising, that's true. Um, what I'd like to do is um, read from the second book in what's becoming known as the August Snow series. Uh, the first book was uh, titled August Snow. Um, and I won't take up too much of your time by reading entire chapters, even though they're, you know, pretty digestible. You know, I, when I write, I don't want to bore myself. 
<laughs> no, so, you know, since I'm the first audience, I really don't want to put myself to sleep, so. <laughs> okay. Chapter one of Lives Laid Away. Uh, I'm sorry, let me back up. For those of you who don't know, um, August Snow is a um, former Marine, uh, ex-DPD cop, uh, detective. He was fired for uh, investigating malfeasance in the mayor's office. Oh, could that ever happen? <laughs> <laughs> um, and he sued and won a $12 million settlement. Uh, when drinking himself to death didn't work, uh, he came back to his family home in Mexican town and started renovating the street that he grew up on. And uh, that's a little bit about August. Her secret ingredient was nutmeg, not a lot, maybe half a teaspoon or less, but she got the same complex undercurrent effect that she would have had with smoked East Indian paprika or authentic Mexican chili powder. I was in my kitchen slowly blending half a teaspoon of nutmeg into my homemade salsa, pureed tomatoes from Honeycomb Market, blanched and coarse chopped tomatoes, chopped jalapenos, minced yellow bell pepper, fresh dill, quarter lemon squeezed, garlic, sea salt, and coarse ground black pepper. I also added just a bit of chopped cilantro. While I diced, pureed, and blended ingredients, I listened to an old CD of my father's, John Lee Hooker and Santana's classic, The Healer, cranked to top volume on my stereo. Perfect music to accompany a rackishly handsome blacksican as he made a poor imitation of his mother's salsa. Courtesy of the potent aroma of the salsa and the music, I could feel my hips, my feet moving to the rhythm of a slow rumba bolero. And yes, cabron, I dance a mean rumba bolero thanks to my mother's patient lessons and the decades of practice I had at, a, at dozens of Mexican weddings one Salvadoran Colombian wedding anniversary and four quinceañeras. I'd even given salsa and rumba lessons at Camp Leatherneck and forward operating base Delhi Beirut in Afghanistan to guys who had just gotten engaged to sweethearts anxiously awaiting stateside. Go ahead. Ask Mar former Marine Corporal Francis Franco Montoya Seattle, Washington, or former Marine Sergeant Dwayne Wee Man Nixon, Memphis, Tennessee. Marine killing machines who would freely admit I'm the only guy they ever loved dancing with. <laughs> <laughs> it had been a week since I'd taken Tatina, my long distance kind of maybe girlfriend, to Metro Airport for her flight home back to Oslo, Norway back to begin her last year of cultural anthropology doctoral studies at the University of Oslo. I was still feeling buoyant from her visit, like Paul blinded by righteousness and beauty. The air in my house still carried her warm chocolate and pepper scent. One thing I hadn't intended to Tina to see during her time in Detroit was a black Chevy Suburban, windows blacked out, crawling down Markham Street at ungodly hours of the morning. Tatina had casually noted the SUV twice during her nighttime bathroom visits. Who are they? She asked over breakfast one morning. Probably somebody coming home from a late shift somewhere. Of course, I knew better. This is Mexican town. The black Chevy Suburban with blacked out windows was ICE, U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement Police, trolling in the dark hard hours, mapping potential nests and safe houses for undocumented immigrants. Their official motto, protecting national security and upholding public safety. 
In Mexican town, we have a different motto for ice. Si es marrón, enchiado. If it's brown, lock it down. I, it, it, this takes me by surprise because I don't get out of the house much. And, uh, you know. <laughs> okay. Um, this this chapter is getting into the crux of the story, essentially. Uh, in, in, and in case you didn't, um, um, it wasn't revealed, um, August is half Mexican-American, half African-American, um, otherwise known as a Blackskin. Um, I'll read a bit of chapter five. Marie Antoinette took a header off the Ambassador Bridge this past Sunday. The infamous 17th century French queen, Archduchess of Austria, and wife of King Louis XVI had narrowly missed the bow of the late freighter Norquist Yannick, its 22-ton brick bulk cargo of iron ore five days out from the port of Duluth Superior. Reaching a terminal velocity of 73 miles per hour, Her Majesty the Queen slammed powdered wig first into the steel gray channeled waters of the Detroit River. The concussive impact snapped her neck, fractured her right orbital, and dislodged the eye from its socket. The Northwest Yonics giant propellers churned the queen under for a bit, catching the hem of her ornate gown, unspooling layers of petticoats, but sparing her the indignity of being sliced into bloody chunks. The bridge had been backed up that day. Nothing new. Over a quarter of the merchandise traded between the US and Canada crosses over the Ambassador Bridge, which connects Detroit to Windsor, Ontario. The nearly 100-year-old structure is constantly choked by trucks laden with goods. Congested as the decaying bridge was, the only eyewitnesses were the usual unreliable ones. No one could recall seeing the 17th century French queen get out of coach, carriage, van, or car, except one witness who swore Madame Deficit, <clears throat> Madame Deficit had emerged from a blue Toyota Camry and entered the US duty-free shop, presumably to buy cake and champagne. <laughs> No such car was found, and neither the U.S. nor Canada duty-free shops, closed-circuit security cameras, had recorded an ornately dressed French queen entering or leaving the premises. No one from the bridge management company, U.S. Border Patrol, Coast Guard, or Homeland Security had anything official or unofficial to say about Miss Antoinette. Bridge video and lane photo surveillance on both sides, equipment rumored to be the same age as the cameras Charlie Chaplin used to film city lights, had yet to reveal the queen's point of entry or provide a clue as to her motivations. Word was whoever delivered the queen to her final destination had a stolen nexus pass allowing them to quickly enter and exit the US and Canada. Maybe the guard was more engaged in finding a four-letter word for Rotomontade than checking out his 200th vehicle for the day. A young black woman who worked in a five-by-five toll booth on the American side apparently busted out laughing when interviewed by a couple of Detroit cops. They'd given her a description of the woman and asked if she remembered such a person. I think I'd remember some cray-cray white girl dressed like some dead-ass queen, she said. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> 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 Which is the wonderful thing about 
fiction. I, as I said, we are a nonfiction bookstore, and I have nothing against fiction, fiction writing. And uh, Stephen Mac Jones's work is crime fiction, which is even more. <laughs> he knows how to get the hook into us, which is what the skill of a fiction writer really, really, really is. So thank, thank you very much. Thank you. So now let's move on to the alias. <laughs> Clarence Young, alias Zigzag Claiborne. And so you're going to have to say a little bit about that alias. And okay. How that came to be. All right, so my name is Clarence Young. Middle initial E. Now, if you Google that, it comes up with a guy that wrote books in the 30s or 40s called the Motor Books for Boys. And he's also associated with the Hardy Boys. So my name was used as a pseudonym by the company that put out the Hardy Boys books. So I went to another author who I respect. His, his, uh, his pen name is Minister Faust. And I said, you have the best pen name I've ever, ever come across. Give me one. So he came up with Zigzag Claiborne. And I've stuck with that ever since. All right, all right. Because if you give her that, you're not going to get anybody but me. <laughs> <laughs> this points up to the, and I hope that the gentleman will talk a little bit about it as we get along. Uh, it points up the um, many varieties of reading that we have. Thanks, come back again. Right. Thanks for saying. Um, and all the little um, nuances of uh, writing, of presenting your writing, of uh, uh, carrying on with your writing and things that get, get into it. So thanks for that. Uh, uh, Sci-fi, fantasy, speculation. That's the way I... I guess go with the umbrella of speculative fiction. Okay. That covers everything. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this book, The Brothers Jetstream Leviathan, has been out for a few years. I'm working on a sequel, which I have samples of on the table, if you care to take them. There are also buttons. I always I have a bunch of buttons made up for a convention I just did. So I've got some left over, so you're welcome to take buttons with you. This came about because I, uh, the, the main premise of it is, you know, it's these two brothers and their crew, black guys, and they're always saving the world, but they never get credit for it. So I figured that's kind of like, the, you know, a microcosm of a black experience in America. How can I turn that into an adventure that has everything from vampires to giant whales to aliens to Bigfoot and make it make sense? I think I succeeded. I think I did. <laughs> so what the piece I want to read you, by this point, the hero has been cloned, there are like 12 clones of him. So they've got one of the clones uh, kind of like in an interrogation room. They're kind of checking him out to see what exactly he can do that the, the real guy can't. Um, it's called, this is actually from about the middle of the book. This chapter is called The Deeper Sea. Looking at a handsomer version of one set, oh, the clones are also younger than the hero. So, looking at a handsomer version of oneself can be problematic, a problem exacerbated by seeing via monitor one's brother and interacting with said version, and clearly fascinated no matter how clinical said brother pretended to be. Boom and Michael's assaults had knocked offline the implanted bioborers. Asme surgically removed them. The clones were kept separated, and Bubba far from them. Neon, L, Foom, and Michael rested with analgesics inside sound-deafening rooms in Foom's compound. Yvonne thought Milo, who's the hero of the book, could use company inside a small anteroom that combined him to observation only. She studied him closely. During the cruise, he had fascinated her to the point that sex would have been a given. Handsome without being aware of it, smart, respectful enough to get lost in her sensuality only when he thought she wasn't looking. Plus, he knew every obscure song Bootsy Collins ever made. <laughs> and a family man traveling with his brother. How often did that happen? Two brothers taking the time on a cruise to enjoy one another's company, who weren't alphas. In the old life, she had done a stint in the army, dealt with subsequent manic mood swings, hustled money from a no-account relative, and set out with a young woman on what they thought would be a run-of-the-mill, innocuous, womanly journey of discovery. Very lifetime network. Instead, she was championing, championing a psychic named Bubba Foom, grappling with the fact that Bigfoot was a sexist prick who stole camping equipment, Standing in a room with a vampire, you got to stop. Oh, also, the, uh, by, by this point, the hero's been turned into a vampire as well. So <laughs> he's, he's had a rough time. <laughs> you got to stop there, she rightfully responded and grieved with herself. Do you drink? She asked Milo. No, he said and glanced at her. She seemed waiting for more. That it, she said. Yeah, he fixed on the monitor. 
Usually people explain why. <laughs> it tastes like piss. Okay, top it closed. I was gonna say we should have a drink. <laughs> How you handling all this, he asked. I'm not. <coughs> Imagine that state of mind the rest of your life. He allowed another brief lapse from the monitor. You don't have to be part of this. Her left hand never knew what to do when she was anxious. It was directionless now. I don't see how I couldn't be, she said. I never realized I was that soft-spoken. The clone responded to Ramsey's dutifully as if that trait was hardwired into Jetstream genetic makeup. The back of my head looks a little funny too. Yeah. Will your relatives miss you, he asked. Hopefully, she said. They weren't very good shots anyway. <laughs> He looked at her, and his eyes half smiled that sad way they had on the cruise when they parted. Cousin runs a drug ring with connections to the mayor, said Yvonne. Ah, political family. What if these clones decide to stay here? What? He stopped abruptly with a drawn breath and a crushed, deflated chest, shaking it off. The monitor's glow filled his face again. What are you supposed to do? She finished and nudged him with her hip. She watched the monitor for signs of whatever he was searching for. You hate being selfish, don't you? He didn't answer. She considered. A bunch of me running around might get the person who was meant for me. She patted his shoulder. You've had a rough day, Mr. Jetstream. Milo sighed. Hey, he said. What else is out there? He shook his head, not wanting to answer. Or what's in here, she clarified, since there's no out there. The world's a serpent swallowing its tail, wondering why everything tastes like ass, he deadpan. <laughs> Exhaustion burned his eyes. His right hand, even though healing quickly, was in swollen agony. His brother was being far too existential in there, but it promised there'd be hell to pay if Milo reared his head. Ramsey's plan to speak with each clone himself first, then parcel them out to Smooth, Fiona, Desiree, and L. Milo was forbidden to come into contact until the assessments were complete. This place have a pool, Yvonne asked. He resisted, pliantly. Come swim with me. He didn't budge. Nothing for you to do here, hero. Swim. You don't have a suit, he said. You should consider that incentive. <laughs> <All right. laughs> I'm sorry. Actually, one thing I, I used to like to do, one, well, I did it once, was um, I asked the audience to call out just a random page number. So I haven't done that, I haven't done that in a while. So let's do that. This book, uh, any number from 1 to 379. <laughs> Anybody? 200. 200. All right. This is usually interesting. Uh, 200. And if there are any two, two, uh, Deep cuss words I'll move out. <laughs> this is chapter 33 called Night Moves. Dubuque, Iowa at night is one of four things. Cool, depending on the breeze coming off the Mississippi. Muggy in the summer, depending. Mostly quiet, if you're there after 1 a.m. And for the most part, white, except for tonight, when three black dudes, two black chicks, a Latina, and an olive complexion Atlantidian uh, they, uh, they, they travel with somebody who's from Atlantis, and we well. <laughs> as one does. <laughs> Rode through town. Dubuque's west side was baby boomer's suburban paradise, and the jet streams rolled slowly through the more affluent areas, windows down, guaranteed to attract private security attention. They parked outside the house of Lee Batch, a prominent Afro-American corporate legal defender and known supporter of the Thum for 10 minutes. The Thum are one of the main villains in the group, the T-H-O-O-M, true humans over ordinary man. So they're kind of like the Scientologists. <laughs> Vampires tended to hang out in the Japanese garden at the Dubuque's Arboretum and Botanical Gardens. Tonight, the jet scenes parked, got out, walked right in, and sat down to catch the end of two vampires' conversation about market share as it related to collateral growth. Smooth wanted to kill them, but Milo said no and made the vampires finish their conversation which was suddenly an exercise in nervous fumbling and repetitive half-sentences told before a stony-faced and minimally blinking audience. The vampires finished. No one spoke. Then Milo said, that was fascinating. 
His words clattered ungainly off the rocks of the garden's central waterfall. Two sharp hand claps startled the upperly mobile vampires. They regarded Smoove as though he were some mad Rasta loony boy. He maintained the stony look for them, then he smiled, and the jet stream party left. First thing in the morning, they went to Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> Born and raised my entire life here in wow. Detroit. Wow. <laughs> See, that's what I mean. The people are right here under our nose. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Okay, so I'll this is the space that I had reserved for uh, Stephen Ward. Um, as I said, Stephen Ward is in uh, Ann Arbor, and it's in Detroit a lot. Uh, <clears throat> but he called uh, earlier to say that things were not working out and he would not be able to be here. So uh, Andre is going to read. He said what to read. So. Um, I have to say that Stephen Ward is a historian and a biographer. Uh, if anybody picked up one of the pamphlets that the Detroit Public Library put together for their 150th anniversary, he wrote the, the piece that they had on biography, what is biography, because they were talking about different parts and uh, categories in the library. So they had him to write that. So he's, he's quite a... Detroiter, even though he's located primarily at the University of Michigan, but he's back and forth, up and down the road a, a lot. So, uh, Andre? Yeah, ready. Who is a historian, teacher of history? Yes. To high school youngsters? In English. English, okay. Yes. And is here. Okay, hi, come on in. So, um, it's funny, it's had to be serendipity that um, this is the book that I will read today and stand in place of Dr. Ward. Um, this book is about James and Gracie Balls, uh, a powerful, powerful activist couple um, based here in Detroit. Um, one of the uh, kind of the pioneers of revolutionary thought here in Detroit. Um, and legend has it that they were the individuals who were uh, influential in bringing Malcolm X here to Detroit to speak on many occasions. Uh, so this book talks about their life uh, in, in love and struggle, the revolutionary lives of James and Grace Lee Boggs. Uh, I'm going to read for you uh, a few pieces from the book um, to just talk about, um, give you a little bit of insight as to uh, who particularly who James Boggs is, because we hear a lot about Grace Lee Boggs, but beside a great woman is always a great man, right? <laughs> Put that around. <laughs> um, so yes, they, 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 they were Grace Lee Boggs um, and James, Lee, James Boggs um, were a proper couple here in Detroit, so we read acknowledgments. My life has been enriched through studying the ideas, activism, and partnership of James and Grace Lee Boggs. Of the many things I gained, one of the most important is a deeper respect and greater appreciation for the importance of community, the connections we have to each other, and the relationships that sustain us. One occasion stands out as my favorite illustration of this importance. In 1990, as James Boggs faced an uncertain future in his battle with cancer, fellow activists and friends of James and Grace Lee Boggs held a community celebration to honor the couple. After several people spoke in tribute and appreciation for the Boggs, Boggs's decades of activism and mentorship, James Boggs delivered a moving speech thanking the assembled comrades, but asking them not to lose sight of the larger community of which they all were a part. I want to thank you for bringing us together in this kind of setting, because I think in this kind of setting, we cannot just celebrate Grace and I, he insisted. Let me tell you something. Grace and I in ourselves is nobody. It is only in relationship to other bodies and many somebodies that anybody is somebody. Let me tell you that. Don't get, don't get it in your cotton picking mind that you are somebody in yourself. In that spirit, I offer these acknowledgments and sincere recognition of the many somebodies who have made me somebody and who have been a part of the journey that produced this book. So 
so this chapter here uh, is a little, give him some insight into the roots of Jimmy Boggs. Um, he's from the South, so just talk a little bit about that. I grew up in a little town called Marion Junction, Alabama, James Boggs frequently called, frequently called, where white people were ladies and gentlemen by day and Ku Klux Klan, Ku, Ku Klux Klaners by night. During his childhood in 1920s and 1930s, he explained, whites committed acts of violence nearly every weekend to set an example so you would be a nice fellow the rest of the week. Saturday night, the sheriff from the nearby Selma would come in shooting and raising cane to see the colored folks run. The refrain of the sheriff and those with him was, see the niggers run. Meanwhile, local white youth who had been drinking at the service station Saturday night might go up the road to have a little fun. They would perhaps meet some Negro and beat him up and leave him laying on the side of the road. The victims of these beatings usually did not die, but in some cases, the violence of whites against their black neighbors did result in murder. Every once in a while, Boggs remembered, you see somebody kill somebody. The murderers would leave the deceased in plain view while other white citizens would sit around and play checkers with the body laying out here. Racial terror and white supremacy permeated the state of Alabama and shaped the environment in which James Boggs was raised. The Ku Klux Klan grew to be an ominous and at times powerful force in the world young Jimmy encountered. The second Ku Klux Klan, KKK, was founded in 1915, four years before he was born, and flourished during the 1920s, sweeping the state's elections in, 19, in 1926. Its members assumed the positions of governor, attorney general, and U.S. senator, while numerous local officials, such as judges, solicitors, sheriffs, and county clerks, also considered themselves Klansmen. A decade later, when Jimmy was in high school, several counties in central Alabama had become hotbeds of Klan terror. At the same time, white communities increasingly used the practice of lynching to terrorize their black neighbors and enforce racial boundaries. During the 1890s, the decade that produced Jim Crow, Alabama led the nation in lynching. Between the years 1889 and 1921, more black people were lynched in Jimmy's County than in, any other, than in any other in the state. Moreover, his birth coincided with escalating racial violence nationally. He was born during the red summer of 1919 when white mobs attacked and then faced resistance and counterattacks from black citizens and communities in 25 cities and towns across the nation between April and October. At multiple and mutually and reinforcing levels, then racial violence and white supremacy shaped the world into which James Boggs was born. Still, racial terror was not the only, nor the, even the most powerful force in his childhood. Jimmy also told stories of his family and community and how they created a nurturing environment that affirmed and encouraged him as a counter to the oppressive social climate of Jim Crow and white supremacy. While the larger white world imposed limits, uh, limits and boundaries, his internal community life fostered a sense of possibility. The environment which I grew up in said, excuse me, the environment which I grew up in said to me very early, you have to make a way out of no way. He told an audience of friends and comrades late in his life. Rather than accept the intended message to stay in your place, Jimmy learned to confront social constraints, even to embrace them as a challenge to take us to another plateau. Jimmy's use of the black folk saying, a way out of no way, is a telling expression of his early 20th century rural Southern upbringing. It signifies both a collective cultural consciousness and a credo of individual behavior built upon a shared experience of faith, resilience, and hope in African-American communities. 
The phrase reflects a sensibility forged in the post-emancipation and Jim Crow South and tradition of empowerment passed down through subsequent generations. Jimmy invoked the phrase not only to highlight the importance of this tradition, tradition in his own his early life, but also to signal that his consciousness was central to his political identity. Speaking more than a half a century after leaving the South and having spent most of his these years engaged in political activism, he recalled the lesson he learned from his mother. She always told me, baby, you do whatever makes you happy in life. But she also said, you ought to always try to do something that makes the world a little better. James Ball would dedicate himself to thinking about and working toward revolutionary change. While his conception of revolutionary revolution evolved over the course of five <coughs> decades, Jimmy's reflections on his childhood and hometown offer an instructive starting point for identifying the sources, contours, and trajectory of his thinking. Embedded in his reflections are key signposts violent repression, family and community resilience, making a way out of no way, commitment to making change that make that map the wellsprings of his subsequent intellectual and political work. These early years taught him enduring lessons. It is to those years we now turn to discern how Jimmy's early experiences propelled him on his journey from Marion Junction to Detroit and set the foundation for the political vision through which he came to see the world and his role in changing it. Thank you. Wow. So, a bunch of not here, but that's okay because we're gonna move right along here. This was going to be a memoir, but I think leaving it at this point is just great. I was gonna ask Andre to sort of start off a conversation with each of you about writing, about your books, and how you see each other having conversations through your writing with each other. Okay. Sure. Um, so thank you for being here uh, to all of you. And I feel like I should probably recalibrate a little bit okay. uh, so that I can see. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, so um, all of you all are from Detroit, have roots in Detroit, the Detroit metro area. Um, how does being a Detroit bred uh, or Michigan bred um, black man color your writing? How does that influence your writing? Can you speak a little bit about that? Maybe we can start with um, Mr. Montgomery. Um, I think in, in some ways it, it definitely does, you know, you know, just you know, just the, the, the reality of being a black man in in Detroit in America. So yes, yeah, so it, uh, it it definitely does. But then I think at the same time, I just also see myself as a as a writer, uh, as as a poet, and someone who just wants to maybe look look at life maybe objectively. Or at least objectively, from my point of view, <laughs> you know, and then maybe just write from that. And w one person said about my writing, he said, "I read some of your poems, and if I didn't know you, I wouldn't know whether you were white or black." Mm -hmm. Now I don't know whether whether that was a compliment or not. <laughs> uh, but but there's, there's some of the poems uh, that, that I write. One would probably think it was written by a black person, you know, just, just by what, what I had to say. But then again, you, you can't always go by that. I remember one time there was a poem that was published years ago, and it was a very militant poem that was published. A lot of people have uh, really liked the poem, liked the expression that it made out. And the writer's name it was a name that you couldn't identify as white or black, kind of an American name. And so they said a lot of great things about it. Then they found out she was white. Then all of a sudden, some of the same people found out of problems with the poem. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Jones, your, a lot of your, I was very intrigued by your book, um, the, your recent book, uh, and how you kind of melded in Detroit landscape. Yes. Uh, and for those who were not from Detroit, 
they were learning about Detroit from those who were from Detroit who just giggled. Uh, <laughs> it was like, oh, that actually makes sense. So can you talk a little bit more about how the, that, how Detroit has influenced your writing in particular since you engage it so much very explicitly in your, in your book? Yes. Um, I am not originally from Detroit. I was born and raised in Lansing, Michigan. And I've been here for about 40 years, which by some standards is a long time. And by other standards, I'm still considered a newbie. Um, oh, you've only been here for 40, 40 years. <laughs> you better come over here. I need to tell you something. <laughs> um, well, um, Detroit is, is really, in the time that I've been here, it's gone through some significant changes. And I've worked um, downtown, uh, Renaissance Center uh, for years. Um, but so I'm familiar with the area. Um, and this is, this is a very intriguing city that gets dealt with in a lot of unfair shorthand. When people outside of the city um, here, Detroit, instantly, within a tenth of a second, they see uh, sparks flying on an assembly line and black poverty and decaying houses. Um, and the 67 riots. And that's the shorthand. And uh, you watch MSNBC, uh, CS, uh, CBS, et cetera, and so forth, uh, whatever news service. And Detroit is, even from a journalistic standpoint, dealt with in a, uh, a shorthand that's both uh, piously pitying and um, dismissive. So I, I kind of took it upon myself uh, with my writing to show the various aspects of this city. Uh, I mean, we're, we're sitting in one of the great bookstores of Detroit. Um, we had an uh, early lunch at uh, the traffic jam and sun. Nobody ever hears about how good the fish and chips is <laughs> <laughs> at traffic jam and sun. But they'll hear about, you know, uh, a 44 shell casing found on you know, Lafayette. So, um, Thank goodness I have a publisher that found Detroit to be not necessarily romantic, but a place that was intriguing uh, to go into more depth on. Um, but yeah, I hope that, that answers the question. Completely. Um, I don't know if I should go by your, go, for purposes of this, I'll go by your pen. Okay, that works. <laughs> Mr. Claiborne. Um, <laughs> so, in, although you don't necessarily have, uh, in the same way, of course, um, Detroit explicitly infused, I am sure that it colors your writing, um, particularly because your characters are black. Mm -hmm. uh, and even more so, the main characters are two black men. Uh, so, can you talk a little bit about how Detroit influenced that, maybe? Since you were born here, raised, talk a little more about that. Well, the only reason I went into speculative fiction is growing up in Detroit, this is a city all about the imagination. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we gave the world Motown. We gave, you know, so much came from Detroit that just was pure sparks of genius. And growing up, me and my brothers, we would, you know, wander the city and find little bits here and bits there and put them together and make things out of them. And that really is the source of where, where I come from in writing and, and my connection with Detroit is that we can take disparate bits of this, this, and this and turn it into magic. And, and as, as far as you know, the, the male aspect of it, you know, 
like 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 Stephen was saying, in Detroit, you, you hear about black men, and your first you know default is always going to be something negative because that's what the media puts out there. I mean, that's a shorthand for a black guy in Detroit. It's not that he's a you know a, a science fiction geek who can talk about Star Trek for hours, <laughs> <laughs> you know, who has seen every episode of the Twilight Zone and can't wait for the new one to start. That's, that's not what you hear. And so I want to. That's in my writing. I like to include things that, I mean, with the, the name Zigzag, I like to make you go one way and take you another. Because that's another thing that's, that's great about Detroit is that, you know, you'll, you'll be walking down a street and, you know, you, you, you think you're in one neighborhood and you, you cross the street and you know, suddenly you, you're in a completely different. I mean, like with the foods, the culture, everything. It's just this wonderful melange of people. And more than anything, I think that's what, what I try to bring to my writing and my connection with the city. Well, uh, to piggyback on that, um, growing up, I was a voracious reader. Um, my mom and dad wouldn't have had it any other way. Um, but as, as you grow older, um, knowing your ethnicity, maybe you don't focus on your ethnicity, but the outside world does. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it starts to um, impact how you think, how you see the world. And I started, most of the books that I read did not have black people in them. Uh, and if they did, uh, like one of my favorite um, uh, crime writers, uh, Robert B. Parker, the Spencer series, Wonderful series, but I always, I always saw Hawk. Uh, are any of you familiar with Hawk? Um, Hawk was always that interesting background. And I started thinking, well, why is he never in the foreground? And for me, it was an impetus to say, your first reaction is, I'm always in the background. Oh, who do I write about this? <laughs> and it was like, well, you call yourself a writer. Why don't you put yourself in the foreground? Like, oh, you mean I have to do something now? <laughs> okay. So, yeah. And speaking about, you know, I guess you can call it role model. Um, who is your favorite writer, um, poet, playwright, uh, and how did that, how did that inspire, how did that writer or uh, playwright poet inspire you to write or had influence on you? That's a tough one. Yes. Well, uh, in terms of poetry, um, I was fortunate enough in my his early 20s to be part of a poetry workshop, the, uh, the Poetry Society of Michigan. And there, there was some really outstanding poets and writers that were part of that group. So as a, as a young person, I really had some great influences. I mean, we would read our poetry and we would have, a, have critique sessions. And they were very helpful, especially for a, a younger poet to do that. So there were poets like Naomi Long Magic, who's the poet lawyer of the city of Detroit, was there. Uh, Dudley Randall, Broadside Press. Then there was Oliver Legrone, who was a poet, uh, poet as well as a sculptor. And um, uh, Ethel Grace Cease, was, who was kind of the president of the organization. And it was, just, uh, it was just wonderful being a part of that. And some of us were in our 20s and 30s, and others in their 40s and 50s and 60s. And we would come together, and we would meet on a regular basis. And not just in Detroit, because it was the Poetry Society in Michigan. So there were chapters around the state of Michigan. So it's something we would have quarterly meetings in other parts of the state. So that just proved to be a really excellent opportunity to engage in with other poets and just learn more and learning how to accept cooks. Tony Morrison. Uh, well, I think Tony Morrison <laughs> taught me that you could do more with one paragraph if you were concise and observant about human nature than a lot of writers can do in like you know 300, 300 pages. So she is she is my go-to as far as 
when I write. I, um, I try to give the reader something that they haven't gotten before, and that's that I get, I get, it, I get that from Tony Morrison, because you'll think Tony is giving you one thing, and by the end of the book, you're like, oh my God, I had no idea I was going there, but I'm glad she took me there. Mm -hmm. So yeah, definitely Tony Morrison, by or not. Yeah, I, I would agree. Tony Morrison, um, Nikki Giovanni, um, some of the Spanish poets, um, well, Mexican poet like Octavio Paz and Pablo Neruda. Um, those, and, and all the way to um, Kurt Vonnegut. Um, so, yeah, they were big influences. Definitely want to, I want to hall, there may be others who may have any questions. So I'm going to ask you just to raise your hand, we'll put you into account, and um, make, make sure you remember your number. So we have you as the one, and two, and anyone else? Three, remember your number? Anybody else? <laughs> and four, uh, and you, maybe one more. Anybody else? Uh, okay, uh, one. Go. Uh, could, could you, um, uh, if, you know, talk a little bit more about the, um, the or have you been able to delineate the, um, and, and then articulate the strategy for uh, the plot carrying aspect of Tony Morrison's work? As far as just how, how, you, how she came about, or? Well, no, how she, what is her strategy? I mean, have you, in your words, her strategy for that plot to be carried by the character Okay. Tony, what, what Tony Morrison does is first and foremost, she, she knows the psychology of the reader. So that factors in, before she puts a single word down, I'm sure she, she knows, she's gotten into your head and my head and everybody else's head. So that's how she's able to use three words and you know exactly what she's saying, where she's going with it, and you move from there. And I think that's what drives her plot. It's, it's not, her books aren't very structurally plot driven. It's more psychologically driven, and I don't, am, am, I, am I in the right vicinity of your question now? Because mm -hmm. I know there are other writers who will sit out and, and you, know, they'll, they'll, you know, there's plotters and there's pantsers, where the plotters plot everything out, and the pantsers just like, I don't pantser, basically. Make it up as you go, and, mm -hmm. and hope it's you know, the best. But I, I, Toni Morrison, from interviews that I've heard, she's not a huge plotter. Mm -hmm. She's more, okay, I, I get this feeling, and I want to convey this feeling in the next 300 words. And every page of that book that she's doing conveys that feeling with precision. to do, so thank you. <laughs> that was harass me not. Harass me, harass me not. Harass me not. By the way, you should copyright yes. that as, you know, so that somebody's going to come along and put that in a spray bottle and just <laughs> copyright. Yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll buy. <laughs> <laughs> but the power of that is that the women need the men standing right there with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mr. Montgomery's work is published, Roses Are Red, poem is published. And this book um, is a collection of Detroit mm -hmm. poetry. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are some features on Mr. Montgomery, Melba Boyd, uh, former chair of the African States Department, and quick plug, my former chair, uh, <laughs> graduate of the African States Department, and uh, many other Detroit poets. So 
do have that available, so if you wanted to check that out. Leslie's like, so. So is Willie. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Oh my goodness, yes, yes. Detroit, Detroit, all the way. Uh, number three. So, how are you? Uh, my name is Leslie Reese. Sorry I came late, but this is more of a comment and a plug. So, I have a, a blog. It's called Folklore and Literacy. And I have a series that I started last summer called Black Men Reading. Mm -hmm. So, if you think you might be interested in being a participant in my series. I would love to talk with you further, talk and or email or whatever, but I'm also happy to be introduced to new uh, black men readers who are writers. And uh, so, Yes, so I look forward to at least shaking your hand and saying hello afterward. Thank you. Yes. Thank you and yes. <laughs> <laughs> and four. Uh, two things. One, pick a random page and I'll read it. It's the gutsiest thing I've ever seen a writer do at reading. <laughs> <laughs> and, and two, uh, I, I asked this all the time of writers, being a writer is kind of lonely. You give up a lot. You know, am I gonna go see a movie tonight? No, I'm writing. Uh, you work all day and you come home and you put words on the page. I'd really like to know what keeps you at it when there's an infinite supply of Black Lightning on Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> well, for me, it's a sense of fun. I mean, I, when I, I hope that as I was reading, you kind of got a sense that this, this book is just a fun, goofy adventure story that you're not going to get from anybody else but me. And that, that's how I kind of approach the writing. It's like, I mean, yes, Black Lightning's out there, Black Panther's out there, all of those out there, but that doesn't stop me from doing what I got to do. And I think that would go right for you, too. I mean, there's Elmore Leonard's out there and everybody else, but there's only you doing what you do. And, and I think, too, if you feel inspired to write something, if you feel inspiration to write something, then wherever it's out there, say, well, that's fine. And that's out there, but I'm inspired to write this. You know? and, and at that point, that's very important uh, to me as, as a writer. You know, a, 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 a thought came to my mind. You know? So regardless of how great some of us may be, I can accept that, compliment that. But it's like, I have this particular thought that I want to deal with right now. Um, you know, uh, yeah, there is a uh, lone wolf aspect to writing, but also, uh, regardless of what type of writing you're doing, I think there's also the joy of uh, world building, what they call world building. Um, you know, I, I can't control uh, a lot of things, um, but I can, to some degree, control my writing. And if I decide to blow it off and say, you know what, I'm getting out of here, I'm going to watch uh, Avengers Infinity War, <laughs> I, I can guarantee you uh, that if you are a writer, you're going to sit there and go, the hell was that? <laughs> I could write a better scene than that. <laughs> and then the little replica of yourself in the back of your head says, well, why aren't you writing that better scene? Yeah. Um, so, I don't know. It's, it's, um, I like the sense of control and I like the sense of uh, adventure. Uh, in writing, because there are times when I want one of my characters to go off to the right to that door and open it slowly, and they're going off to the left and opening a window. And it's like, what, are you, what the hell are you doing over there? Well, <laughs> oh, maybe I should just follow this. So, yeah. 
And yeah, that sense of exploration is, is a big part of it where, yes. you know, even if you are a plotter, you, there's still that, that element of, I don't know really what's going to happen next. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that really keeps me in front of the typewriter and, 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 and just, just going at it. Welcome, sir. Uh, thank you for that. <laughs> um, this is Yusef Bajji Secure. Coming down from Lansing. Yes. You made it. Yay. Yay. And I think it's a perfect time because um, Yusuf's uh, book, over there, Window uh, to My Soul. And uh, he grew up here in Detroit, I, as I said before you came, in uh, Zone 8, where I also grew up. <laughs> Some decades before you were there. Uh, and uh, he uh, is going to read for us. I wanted, wanted to catch his breath a little bit. And um, while he's doing that, I did want to say that um, Stephen Ward wanted us to know that he picked these passages for today because this is the year of Jimmy Box's 100th birthday. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was very poignant for he, him to select like that and um, to bring that part to us. So we've heard poetry, we've heard crime fiction, We've heard zigzag, fancy, <laughs> <laughs> speculative. I like to say them all, speculative. And um, uh, Andre has read uh, from the nonfiction book for the evening, uh, Grace and Jimmy Lee Boggs, story of Stephen Ward, who's going to make it today. So um, if you wish, we'll, we'll go right to you, and then we'll fold in after that. All right, so. But I've done. <laughs> so I'm gonna read an excerpt from my um, first book, and this is the, uh, the actual letters that I wrote to my father while I was in prison. And then I'm gonna read some from that the response. It said, "Dear Dad, I seen the address on the envelope. You can see I'm down the road from you. I've been in prison for about three months now. I came to prison for assault, assault with intent to rob, unarmed." I was given five to 15 years for a crime I didn't even do. Crime some of my homies did. Now, now they got me in this hell hole for a crime I didn't do. My attitude is fuck it. Even though because it came with the street game of being a zone eight. It don't fucking matter anyway, cause I'm gonna get out on appeal. Cause none of the fucking witness put me at the crime. The fucking black judge talking about he was gonna send a message back to my hood. Shit only gonna be a minute before I before I'm back on the street anyway. My mama already paid for a lawyer. I know you're wondering why I wrote you to tell you I was locked up. I was just not trying to hear one of those I told you speeches. I got your hookup and dress from James. After being here for a minute, me and my bumping got into a fight. The coward nigga caught himself trying to act hard, and I was not having none of that. They put me in a hole. Then you got all these fake religious guys trying to kick knowledge to me. And they be messing with fags and all, all type of shit. They be asking me to come in there, to come to a religious service, but I tell them I'm straight. Because I can't, because I can get in trouble by myself. My attitude is I'm a nigga, I'm gonna be a nigga for life. So mind you, I just turned 19 when I wrote that letter. Mm -hmm. It says, well, peace be upon you, well, my beloved son. I just received your letter today informing that the beast, prison, has devoured you and that you're in one of uh, your prisons. First of all, let me say it truly saddens my heart and so to learn that you're presently here in one of these concentration camps. Son, I would never give you one of those I told you speeches because, the, the, because things happen. And as a conscious black man, it's not by accident that you and hundreds of thousands of other black males have, have find themselves being led to the slaughterhouse in one of these concentration camps. Your faults as a young man are a result of not having in your life to help nurture and develop you. Your mama did the best she could without the help of any man to raise you. I can never be ashamed of you. Let the truth be told, I am ashamed of myself. Because I, I wasn't there consistently throughout your life to raise you. By you not having a father in your life, the streets became your father. As for millions of other black males throughout the, uh, this racist country. It doesn't make a difference why you came to prison. One day being incarcerated is too long for because your freedom has been taken from you. I'm glad to hear that you didn't come with a natural life or a book of time. It sounded like you were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Joseph, 
I understand that your attitude is messed up from being incarcerated for, for something that you didn't do. Listen up, son. You're in the belly of the beast. You can't hold your head down now, mopping around about the fact that you're locked up for a crime you didn't do. The reality is that you, that you are here now, and having that attitude will not help you, but will hurt you in the long run. You have to begin doing your time, not letting your time do, do you. What I mean by this, this, that you need to begin to work to better yourself mentally, physically, and spiritually. Your primary focus is to earn your freedom, and not to get caught up in any of the foolishness. Receiving, no, no. Just respect everyone, but trust no one. Trust only belongs to God. It is not to be given to any man but earn through his actions and deeds. He says, P.S. I'm skipping through the letter. You misspelled knowledge, religion, envelope, address, message, and religious. If you don't have a dictionary, you need to get one. Not messages in prison, you study dictionary from the beginning to end. Words are powerful because they convey who we are. <coughs> use your mind to free yourself, or, someone, or somebody will use your mind to keep you a slave. Oh, yeah. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Yeah, I have to ask um, Mr. Shakur uh, this question because we asked the question earlier. But I've, I've seen you around and heard of your work, so uh, I have to share. I hope that you will share your your experience with this. Um, how does Detroit, uh, your experiences growing up in Detroit, uh, color influence your writing? You said Detroit color. <laughs> how does Detroit influence your writing? Uh, Detroit. Um. I mean, for me as a, as a writer, I, I, I didn't necessarily want to follow the traditional standards of writing. Uh, wasn't necessarily trying to get like published by a publishing company. So again, uh, thinking about it in terms of Detroit, you know, we always tend to do it our way. You know, putting putting our own twist, our own uh, uh to it. So you know, like I don't use the word understand. I use the word overstand. Uh, I don't use the word situation, I use the word situation. I mean, so adding flavor, um, again, the, the mechanics of writing, not necessarily trying to follow those, uh, this whole English standard. Uh, and I think that's part of Detroit um, that, that has influenced the writing that I did. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions, particularly for Mr. Shakur? No? So we definitely want to thank all of you for joining us. Um, this was definitely a pleasure for me personally, uh, and I can, sh I'm sure I have the opportunity for the audience and sharing the same thing. Um, we have all of their books here for you to purchase. If you would like <coughs> to do so, please um, purchase their books, uh, support them, um, because as you know, black male writers oftentimes do not get as much hype as they should, uh, and it should not be uh, an exception that we think of um, these Detroit writers and others uh, who are born, raised, bred here in Detroit. Um, so support, 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 uh, and we have them available here for your purchase. All right? Okay, thank you so much, Alex. Thank you so much for being here, and it's really uh, inspiring to hear uh, the writers uh, talk about their, read their works, and then to talk about their works. Uh, I really want to do this again, and if you think it's a good idea, I sure will, and um, so look forward to that. Uh, thank you so much, Bunchy, for getting here. That was hard, I know. <laughs> 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 Your spirit was coming on. We had it coming down the road. I'm telling you. Yeah, that wins. Yeah. <laughs> uh, also, should you purchase books, the authors are here, and they will autograph. Now, I'll sign your book. I'll sign anything. <laughs> <laughs> but they will autograph. Okay? Thank well, you thank for you. having us. Well, yeah, thank you. Great. Thank you.